So this is my work and um, uh, let me say that I would rather have you interrupt me while I'm uh, talking because otherwise I'm talking to a screen. And if you have any questions, please do, do interrupt and uh, let me know. So this is um, recent work that I have done with Goran Malic. He is a postdoc in my group. And uh, this is uh, about rigidity, circuits and combinatorial resultants, a mixture of topics that I have never uh, approached before in my research. So let's see, oops, so now something, ah, okay, good. So let me start with the motivation. And I, work, I use the uh, name of a problem called localization as motivation, but the talk will not be about that. <laughs> so the talk will be about this object called circuit polynomials. And um, now this is uh, also related to uh, a talk I was giving in the morning, uh, and it's good to use it as a motivation because uh, in um, computational chemistry or biology where I spent another part of my research time, there are many things that have to do with graphs embedded in, in fact, in three dimensions, uh, whether they are proteins or uh, other types of chemicals solved with uh, the method called NMR or with X-ray crystallography. Ultimately, we have a graph structure and we have some information about distances between the various atoms. Uh, some partial information, some uh, uh, not so exact information. We'll assume that the information is exact, but not all the distances are known. And then the question is, we, you want to put together the coordinates of the molecule. And in fact, that's how we get the data when we work with it. This picture is taken from one uh, piece of software that is doing exactly such calculations. And so the localization problem is, of course, the abstraction of this has many applications besides molecular structure determination. Uh, the terminology, I think, comes mostly from the recent uh, approach with um, sensor networks. So they want to localize various objects in, in a space where some anchors are given. But anyway, abstractly speaking, we have a graph and some positive weights on its edges. And the problem is to find the place, placement of the points of the vertices in the plane, and of course up to isometries, so that the edge length match the given weights. It's sometimes called the realization problem, and it is definitely the main problem in the beautiful area of geometry called distance geometry with a very distinguished history. So here's, um, here are three examples of graphs, and I give you some weights for them. And uh, uh, there are things that uh, we can do, right? We want to solve that. And here's how, in principle, you could solve it, yeah? You can set up a system of quadratic equations where the unknowns are the Cartesian coordinates and uh, write the, uh, solution, the um, uh, equation that the uh, length of an edge is what you expect it to be. And the uh, possible placements will be among the real solutions of this system. And usually it can be very large. And um, rigidity theory comes here because it can help predict a priori, right? Even before attempting to solve the system, whether the system will have uh, solutions that will form a discrete set in, in the case when the given graph is rigid or a continuous if the graph is flexible, right? So for instance, this graph here, it's flexible. And although I give you here a realization is by no way uh, no way is the only one. In fact, it's a continuum. It can deform continuously in the plane, maintaining the edge lengths. The second one is minimally rigid. Minimally means that if you remove any edge, it will become flexible. And this one has, an, in general, will have finite isolated, a finite set of isolated solutions, but in this case, there are just exactly 12. And this one is what is called the globally rigid one and it has a unique solution for the given edge length. Okay, so how we, can we solve it? In the rigid case, well, you need some solver and the double exponential Grevner basis algorithm can be used in principle, right? To eliminate all but one of the variables. And then you get a polynomial in a single variable and use numerical method and select one of the solutions, substitute, 
eliminate to get another polynomial in a new variable and repeat. Yeah, so in principle, this is doable. Yeah, but of course it is not practically applicable. <laughs> Nobody would proceed in this fashion except for very, very small cases. And um, what, um, what is needed, I think, it's a better mathematical understanding of the problem. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm not proposing something that would be uh, extraordinary uh, breaking uh, breakthrough in the localization problem, but I think that uh, methods like this that work for general systems of equations may benefit from deeper understanding about what is specific about the distance system. So what we um, will see in a moment, we call that being in the KD Menger ideal. Okay, so. Um, that's the motivation. And of course, because I'm here at the Quran, and uh, I already told the people who came earlier so that I have a stronger motivation for talking about the algebraic part of this talk, because years ago I uh, sat in a course that Ricky was teaching when uh, he was uh, uh, working on the book that became the book with uh, Marie Francoise and with Shaugata. And uh, I attended a course. Uh, I wanted to learn this uh, and related things at that time. And of course, it went over my head. But as always, uh, it comes back in your research. And I'm happy that uh, I'm at a time when I can use something that I have learned in those rooms at NYU so many years ago and pay homage to, uh, to Ricky by attending this seminar. So good, back uh, to my talk, this problem is in fact a mathematical problem inspired by localization and distance geometry. It's not about uh, distance geometry. And let me do a, a one more step before getting there. So I'm going to talk about the simplified version of the previous problem, the single unknown distance, where again, we are given a graph and some positive weights on uh, the edges, but uh, we don't want to find all the coordinates of all the points. We just want to find the possible values in all possible placements of a single unknown distance, yeah? So in other words, that's your graph and that's the distance that you don't know what it is and you would like to know what is what are the possible values of this particular distance. And in fact, this is polynomially related to the, um, to the other problem because if we could solve this problem efficiently, we could do a trilateration and in, a quadratic, in quadratically many, uh, well, in uh, linearly many, solutions of quadratically solvable equations, we could get the localization. So they are related. It's, it just sounds simpler, but it's not. So again, we can solve it in the same fashion, but using KV coordinates now. So what I mean is the unknowns now are square distances between points instead of Cartesian coordinates. And the essence of what I will be talking about is the use of various theorems from rigidity theory, from distance geometry, rigidity theory, matroid theory, to reduce this problem to finding a certain irreducible polynomial in the Cayley-Menger ideal. And that is called the circuit polynomial. And I'll tell you a little later what, what is doing. It, it is uh, defined in the context of uh, matroid theory for um, algebraic matroid theory for the Cayley-Menger ideal. But let me tell you what the interesting properties are. So the support of this polynomial is a graph. Yeah, so we are talking about a graph and the polynomial is on variables that correspond to edges of a graph. And so the support is a graph that is called the circuit in the combina, now I'm talking about the combinatorial rigidity matroid. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So the graph here on top, is a minimally rigid graph, uh, which means that in almost all the possible <laughs> realizations, uh, they, in, in almost all the possible, almost all, which means except for a measure zero set of possible length, uh, this will have a finite number of solutions. And uh, the minima, it's minimal in the sense that if you remove any edge, it becomes flexible. And now let's say that I want this distance. And now if I add this distance, it creates here a subgraph, which is a circuit. So terminology coming from rigidity, from, a, from matroid theory. So the minimally rigid graphs are the basis of a matroid on the edges of a graph. 
and these are the bases, and this is the minimal dependence set. And of course, it's related to the motivation coming from linear and algebraic matroids. But let's just focus for the time being on the combinatorics. I add this edge, I, add, I get this graph. I add this edge, I get this circuit. I add this edge, I get another circuit. So the moment when you add an edge, you form a graph that has recognizable properties. You can recognize without any algebra or linear algebra. And, uh, and that is what will be the building blocks of what I will be talking about. So as I said, each new edge induces a rigidity circuit graph. So when I say rigidity circuit, I mean a graph. Okay, and each circuit, on the other hand, induces a unique circuit polynomial. So that's the correspondence. Behind this, there are a number of, uh, of uh, theorems in uh, uh, Kaley Menger uh, algebraic matroid um, in um, uh, properties about the ideal generated by the Kaley Menger miners and the theorem of uh, Lovas and Dress. And I'll get to this towards the end of my talk about the algebraic motivation. But the uniqueness comes from the theorem of uh, Lovas and Dress. Okay, so okay, one, one little question, Ileana. Do all yeah. these rigidity statements are assumed to be within the, a two-dimensional embedding, right? They have yes, okay, okay. yes. So uh, I only talk about the dimension to here, and uh, that's a very good question. And let me explain why. I would like to be to be able to talk about what happens in dimension three. So there is something in dimension three. The main difference is that we do not have a combinatorial characterization in dimension three. So everything that I'm talking about, the uniqueness of the polynomial, the existence of the polynomial, even the existence of these graphs that are circuits, these properties exist in any dimension. But the combinatorial understanding and everything that I will be doing on the combinatorial part does not translate in, does not extend to higher dimensions because what is behind it is, it's a question that is, uh, has been around for over 150 years, going back to a paper of Maxwell. And the uh, combinatorial characterizations of rigidity in dimension three or higher is not known. Okay. Good. So aspects and of what I, I'm talking are, are can be generalized, but definitely not the combinatorics. Uh, and I have a naive question. So what is the definition of circuit? When you say circuit, uh, it seems like a special type of graph. Yes. Yes, so I'm going to give you the definition. So on the combinatorial uh, uh, side, I will give you all the definitions. Yes, so uh, but I, as, a preview, I... as a preview, I can tell you that the circuit is not a cycle in a graph. It's a circuit in the rigidity matrix. So let me do a little um, uh, without slides, this uh, analogy. If you know, uh, if we have a, a graph, the trees, the let's say that is connected, the spanning trees of the complete graph, they form a matroid. That's the classical example of, of a matroid, of a combinatorial matroid. And the um, uh, circuits, the, the minimal dependent sets in this matroid are cycles. And that's where the terminology comes from cycle circuit, but this is circuit in the rigidity matroid, which is another matroid on, uh, on, a, on the edges of the complete graph. Yeah, I'll get to a little um, explanation of these properties in a moment, but that's the terminology comes from matroid theory. Thank you for so, the question. Yes, any other uh, I apologize, just one uh, brief question so, to make sure I understand. Uh, you will talk about these uh, minimal, uh, uh, rigidity graphs or circuits in this uh, matroid, and these will be independent of any choice of of uh, of uh, weights, right? So you're just uh, right. So these are going to be just graphs because then you want to eventually add weights and say that those uh, are rigidly determined by the weights. Yeah, actually, actually, it's a yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> so actually, I will write um, a polynomial which is in the unknowns corresponding to edges. Yes, so if you want now to solve the single distance problem, you just plug in values for the edges that you know, and then you get a polynomial in just one. Uh, that's what is now on my slides. You substitute the edge length in the circuit polynomial. We get a univariate in the unknown distance, and it's just a univariate uh, polynomial, you solve it. Yes, so this is in fact one of the 
phases of an elimination. This is what the Grebner basis would have done for you. Yeah, the point is that we are doing much better than the Grebner basis. And I will show you in a moment because we are very proud how, how much we can beat by taking advantage of properties of these uh, circuits. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. So let me minimize now. Okay. Oops. Okay. So here's the main problem. That's the problem that uh, we want to solve. We will be given a rigidity circuit. In other words, we are going to be given a graph with certain properties and I'll define them in a moment. Yes. And I want to compute a polynomial. Yes, a polynomial whose, edge, whose variables correspond to the edges of this graph. And it is in fact a unique polynomial. It's an irreducible polynomial. And that's it. And you can use it as a template for any problem on that graph. If you just plug in some values, you'll be able to solve for any unknown uh, value. Okay, so that's the, the point. Well, there is a longer story here. It's uh, in fact, they, these polynomials shed light on the structure of the Katie Menger idea. So it is more from a certain point, I'm going to become very I'm going to move away from the practical application. And in fact, what is interesting here is the mathematical problem. Okay. So let me continue a little bit. So let me start with an example, just so you, you get a flavor of what is happening here. So the smallest circuit is the complete graph on, K, on four vertices, the K4. Yeah, so this is the graph. And this is the polynomial. In fact, we don't even need to compute it because it comes from free as a generator of the Katie Menger ideal. I'll talk about that in a moment, but this is it. It's, this is the polynomial. And this polynomial, the support, in other words, the variables that appear in the polynomial, you see they're in one-to-one -one correspondence to the edges of K4, yeah? And uh, this is how we'd be using, uh, I'm, I already answered part of this question, we'll be using the circuit polynomial to see, solve the single unknown distance problem. So we take the polynomial, we decide what is the unknown and the others, we plug in the known values, the weights. Yes, I can plug in for all the other edges. And you see that this is a polynomial of degree two in the variable one four, x one four. So it will have two solutions. And it's easy to see that this graph with fixed uh, lengths for the other edges will have exactly two solutions. Of course, for some values, those will be complex. Okay, good. So that is the main problem. Localization was the motivation, but the main problem is to compute circuit polynomials. Okay. So now how tractable it is? Well, again, we are back to, to the double exponential Grubner basis. And in fact, we tried to compute it. And let me tell you what we managed. So beyond the uh, K4, which comes from free, for, uh, for, for free, we were able to only compute the next circuit, which is on five vertices. It, th that was very fast. You can do it in Mathematica yourself. I'll show you how if you want to. But then we wanted others that are larger, a specific one on six vertices. We tried a number of them. One, it's impossible to this day. We cannot compute it. The largest we could do, but we still use some combinatorial insights. It was not just blind Grubner basis. It took five days and six hours. And I'll show you uh, uh, soon what that one was. Yeah, so in all other cases, the execution timed out or crashed. So our goal is to make such calculations more tractable by taking advantage of structural information inherent in the problem, And right? So main mathematical goal of, of this line of research is a structural understanding of the Katie Menger polynomial ideal. So in other words, the polynomials that satisfy certain conditions, I'll define it later. I have to define a lot of concepts, unfortunately. The paper relies on concepts from, from so many areas that it is, um, yeah, it is, uh, it is hard to, uh, to uh, just sweep them under the rug. They have to be defined. So the full paper has all the definitions. But in my presentation, I will focus primarily for the purpose of this seminar on the combinatorial one. one. So this is, these are our results. Yeah, so we have a new algorithm to compute a circuit polynomial with known support. And it's not based on Grubner basis, it's based on resultant 
in so it's elimination based with uh, elimination that is done with resultant the classical Sylvester resultant elimination steps, but is guided by a novel inductive construction for EGTT circuits. So it's guided by combinatorics. Yeah. So uh, let me brag a little bit, if I may. So let me go back. Yeah. Pure algebra, five days and six hours combinatorics uh, gives us, I'm not going to reveal, but I'll tell you in a moment, much, much less. Yeah. So we'll, we, we're able to beat this. Good, so here it is, the experimental result. So the only previously known circuit polynomial was this K4, right? So it's already a generator. So we obtain all of them with five, six, and a few with seven. We cannot push it too far, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so these are the circuits, the graphs that have the properties of being circuits on six vertices, of course, up to isomorphism and all that. And uh, this is a K33 plus an extra edge. This is, sometimes it's called the desire graph because without this edge uh, in a particular realization looks like the desire configuration from in incidence geometry, a wheel and the so-called to the double banana. And here are the results. Yeah, so let me point out the one that we are very proud of. So this is the one that took five days and six hours. And our method sold it in less than 15 seconds. This is the size of the polynomial, just to see how fast they grow. Yes, remember that these are, these are in fact homogeneous polynomials. This is the homogeneous degree. And the number of variables is uh, 2n minus two. So it's a number that is motivated by the size of the circuits in the, uh, rigidity matroid. So the one that gave us the most headache, it's the K33 plus one. To this day, we were unable to solve it with Grebner and we tried supercomputers and all sorts of very various things. Even our method was not enough. So what I'm going to present today will be about this method based on resultants and combinatorial resultants. And we have an extended algorithm which we could use in order to finally get to compute this 1 million something plus term polynomial in that many seconds. <laughs> and you see we were able, it's, it's not just the size, there is an inherent complexity in this polynomial. Uh, these polynomials have inherent complexity. This one, it has 2 million and a half and we got it in less than, you know, a minute and a half. Okay, so these are the math, uh, these are the results. So, so just so that um, we demonstrate that we can do better than the off the shelf methods. And by specializing and taking, um, taking um, into is about you, although I can present. Uh, Number one, jumping, I'm going to introduce one like very 10 seconds. Uh, would you mind repeating what you just said because we missed like the last 10 seconds, or at least I did? Oh, 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 oh. okay. I think we all did. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, so I was here on this slide, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, I don't know exactly when you lost me, but I was saying that it is more than just the complexity of the result, right? So this one is 2 million and a half uh, terms and we got it in less than two minutes. Yes, a minute and a half. And uh, this one, which is less than a million terms, we got it in 15 seconds. This one, which is half the size, we could not do it even with our method, yeah? So this requires an extension of our method that is for a future talk. Just so, but, but we have it and we could infer a lot of interesting properties about that. Yeah, so that, that was my point. So it's not just the degree or the number of terms, there is something inherent in the structure and it's the structure that I'm trying now to uncover. Okay. Okay. Good, everybody hears me, yes? Yes. Good, okay. So now here's an overview of what I want to present. So number one, I want to define this graph so that you become familiar with them. And I want to define this new concept. So this is a concept that we introduced and I'll motivate it. 
and uh, it's called the combinatorial resultant of two graphs, and in particular of two graphs that are rigidity circuits, because that's where it has a very specific interpretation. And then we have the combinatorial theorem, where we prove that every rigidity circuit can be inductively constructed with this operation from base graphs that are uh, complete graphs on four vertices. Yeah. And then we have the algebraic counterpart of that that says that this inductive construction can serve as a blueprint for applying Sylvester resultants. And when we apply Sylvester resultants, we remain in the same ideal and eventually we'll, at each step we'll get, will be in the, uh, in the ideal generated by the, uh, it's a principal ideal generated by the circuit polynomial that we are aiming to get. And uh, this uh, will require factorization and uh, possibly ideal membership to obtain the desired polynomial. Now, the method is much faster, <laughs> but it's still exponential. The advantage is mathematical, that it provides structural insights into algebraic elimination problems in particular case of distance geometry uh, questions. Yes, in the KD Menger ideal. And there are a lot of very interesting open questions. Some of them are combinatorial, some of them are uh, algebraic. So it, is, it reaches um, uh, different audiences. So now in terms of keywords for this talk, <laughs> well, we need some rigidity theor theory. We need to define the KD Menger ideal. We need some insights from matroid theory and especially the algebraic one that is, has not been widely used, although it was at the beginning of matroid theory, it came from the algebraic uh, direction and then linear and combinatorial came later. We want to talk about algebraic matrix defined by a prime ideal. Again, it's not very usual to proceed in this fashion. Uh, Van der Verden, who introduced algebraic matrix, uh, talked uh, in principle about uh, algebraically independent um, values, about a, a fixed uh, set of uh, elements in an uh, algebraic extension of a, of a field and uh, about independence properties among subsets. So that was the uh, original way in, in which it was defined, but defined by a prime ideal, there is a theorem that definitely relates the two. And that is the setting that we are working with. And of course, there is also a little bit of elimination theory and what is the resultant in Grebner basis. So I will not be able to introduce all of these. So you have to bear with me. So let me start with the most fun part, the combinatorial part with rigidity theory. And uh, the goal is to introduce this new concept. But let me start with a brief introduction and tell me how, how you should think about these graphs. The building elements are these graphs that are called Laman graphs. Uh, the, to, to have an example, always think that a triangulation of a polygon is a Laman graph. So this is made of triangles. And the defining property is that if you take any subset of vertices, n prime less than n, uh, they spend at most, oh, it should have been a prime here. I just noticed. It sh they should spend to n prime minus three edges at most. And the total number of edges, it's exactly to n minus three. So it's a sparsity property. Okay. And uh, this, uh, um, this is for dimension two. So if you think about dimension one, these counts will become exactly the counts of spanning trees. So the minimally rigid graphs in dimension one are the trees. The rigidity matroid in dimension one is the classical, uh, classical matroid, graphical, graphical matroid. And uh, in dimension two, we have Laman theorem that connects these graphs with the sparsity properties to the minimally rigid graphs, which means graphs that, except for a measured zero set of, of uh, distances, they will be rigid. They will not move, they will not flex. Yeah, of course the definition has to be made precise, but I'm giving you just the top level intuitions. And uh, to uh, go back to one of the questions that was asked earlier, this is what is not extending in higher dimensions. We do not have the counterpart of Laman theorem in higher dimensions. We do not have um, 
characterization in, in terms of the sparsity, although there exists sparsity conditions due to Maxwell from the 19th century, the famous physicist, but those conditions are known not to be sufficient. They are just necessary. So, and they don't form a matroid, by the way. Anyway, so that's the just the introduction. And now the viewpoint from uh, matroids is the following that matroids are an abstraction of dependence, independence and dependence. And the basis of the rigidity matroid are the Laman graphs. Independent sets are subgraphs of the Laman graph. So all the graphs that are sparse, in other words, flexible and independent, yeah? So those are independent. And dependent are those that are not independent. They are not two, three sparse. And circuits are minimally dependent. Yes, if you want to have an intuition about this, uh, if you are not familiar with this, if you translate this to trees, the basis for the one dimensional rigidity matroid are spanning trees, the independent ones are, are forests, the dependent ones are those that have at least one cycle, and the circuits are exactly the cycles. Yeah, so exactly tightly the cycles. And these are examples of circuits, yeah. And uh, now in terms of sparsity, they have this nice characterization also. On all subsets less than n prime, they span at most to n prime minus three, n prime, n prime is missing here. But the total number of edges now is two n minus two. Yeah, so there is also a very nice, just combinatorial description of these graphs. So this, the, these are the graphs that we work with. Yeah, any questions? Okay, so let me continue. So now, if I take a minimally rigid graph, a Laman graph, and I add one edge, it will still have 2n minus 2, yes, one more than the Laman, but it doesn't have to be a circuit. However, it will always have a unique circle inside, and that is one defining property, and I'm going to use it in the proofs. Okay, so th these are the objects that we work with. So here are some examples for three, five, for n equals four, five, and six. And yeah, from seven on, there will be many more and they will grow quite fast after that. There are groups in, uh, in that work on enumerating them and finding various properties and so on. Good, so now, many proofs in rigidity theory rely on the fact that we can construct some of these graphs inductively, adding one edge, one vertex at a time. And this makes the algebraic part of the proofs because when we talk about rigidity, we have to do some algebra <laughs> at some point and it makes the algebraic part work. So I'm going to start with one operation that has not been used before for these purposes, but is frequently encountered. It's called the two sum. So you have, that's a general operation on graphs. Yeah, you have two graphs and uh, you, identify two, two vertices and two edges. So what I mean is that these two edges, do you see my mouse by the way? Yes. Ah, good, okay. So these two vertices will be identified and these two vertices will be identified and these two, uh, this edge and this edge will be identified, but I drew them separately so that you see that we start with two graphs, yeah, separate graphs. And uh, there they are, and then I, I identify I choose an edge in each one, I identify, and then I delete this edge. And that is called a two sum of two graphs in general. Yeah, so that's the operation. Now, in the particular case, when the two graphs that I started with are circuits, just using the sparsity properties, we can prove, and it's very easy actually, that the sum, the two sum is also a circuit. Yeah. And vice versa, if you give me a circuit that has a separating pair like this, yes, a graph that has two vertices that if you remove, it, they disconnect the graph and there is no edge between them, we can do the operation in reverse and we get two circuits. So that's, that op this operation keeps us in the class of uh, circuits. Okay. So in general, if I give a, I have a graph that is two connected, but not three connected, the circuits have to be two connected. It's easy to prove. 
But if they are not three connected, there will be these separating pairs. And we can always uh, split them according to, this is the TAD decomposition of a uh, two connected graph into three connected components applied to circuits. And there is a very fast algorithm, Hopcroft and Targent's algorithm for actually computing the decomposition. Okay, so we can handle the two connected uh, ones that are not three connected. So what remains is to, what do we do about those that are three connected? So there is a beautiful result due to Bergen and Jordan. I should pronounce it this way. He's Hungarian. And uh, uh, this is a theorem that uh, was um, um, appeared around the year 2000, 2001 or something. It, uh, it was used to, uh, solve a conjecture of Bob Connolly. And it's a beautiful combinatorial result that says that if you have a circuit graph like this, that is three connected, you can build it with this simple operation. And it's referred to, it's called Henneberg twin rigidity theory because of a, a German engineer that in the beginning of the 20th century described it in an engineering book, how you can produce this kind of rigid, minimally rigid graphs. So this is a graph that is a circuit. And what I'm doing, I'm taking an edge and the vertex. And it's like shooting, you know, shooting a ray. <laughs> so we, uh, we um, remove this edge UV, but replace it with three edges from uh, A to W, A to U and A to V. So we, we introduce a new vertex and uh, three edges by removing one. And it's very easy to verify that this uh, is actually maintaining the counts of 2n minus 2 necessary for a circuit. But not only that, uh, it is um, maintaining the property of being a circuit. So that was the result of Bergen and Jordan. And uh, the problem is that if, if we want to use it for our purposes, such an operation has to have a direct algebraic interpretation. And the, we don't know. I, we, we, that's in fact how we started. We thought that maybe Henneberg to extensions could have some geometric interpretation, algebraic interpretation. We couldn't find one. So our goal is to have a similar construction, but an inductive construction with an operation that has a direct algebraic interpretation. And that is what we have obtained. OK? so. So let me show you. So we define the combinatorial resultant as a generalization of the two sum, but actually a direct interpretation of what a Sylvester resultant will do when applied on polynomials of this type. Any, any question? OK. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. OK. Good. So let me do uh, an example. So this is the smallest case. So this is a wheel. It's the smallest three connected circuit. And it cannot be obtained by two sums because it is three connected. Yeah, we need something that is not three connected to apply that. So here's what we will do. So we start with two K4 graphs. And instead of joining them, gluing them along an edge, we are going to identify two triangles in this case. And in these two triangles, we have to identify an edge that we want to eliminate, yeah? And so now let's identify them, take the union of the edges in other words. So identify the vertices, identify the edges, take the union, and then delete the edge that we wanted to remove. And here we got the wheel, yeah? So this is the operation. So this is the combinatorial resultant operation that we introduced. So it is an operation that works for arbitrary graphs, uh, C1 and C2, not necessarily circuits. They must overlap on at least one edge. And we define the, uh, we take the union of the edges and delete the, um, the edge that we want to do the elimination. And the important property is that this combinatorial resultant has a direct algebraic interpretation as the Sylvester resultant of two polynomials in this KD Menger ideal. Uh, so that is the punchline. So let me tell you a little bit 
uh, we would have been thrilled to be able to generalize uh, the Bergen-Jordan theorem and get a nice construction in the same spirit as they did. So here's the first question. Under what conditions is the combinatorial resultant of two circuits also a circuit? Because it is not true in general, yeah. And uh, the reality is that this is still an open question. So we could obtain an inductive construction, but in fact, it works in the sense that we prove that it exists, but uh, it's hard to tell in the forward direction how you should proceed so that you always get circuits from your um, in, the, in the forward direction of constructing this. Yeah, so under what condition is the combinatorial resultant of two circuits also a circuit remains an open question. However, we know something. We know that in order for this to work, the intersection of the two circuits has to be a minimally rigid graph, a Laman graph. So uh, the example that I gave you with the wheel, they were overlapping on a triangle, which is uh, obviously a rigid graph, a minimally rigid graph. So, but it's only a necessary condition. So we have examples like, a, like this one, where you do the uh, combinatorial resultant of two graphs overlapping on a Laman graph, these are two triangles, moving one edge, and what you get is not a circuit. And another one where we, we have similarly two graphs, they overlap in a triangle in this case, eliminate this and you get a circuit, yeah? So it's not in general true. We need some other condition. However, and this is the punchline, yeah? So there are lots of interesting open questions here, but we have, um, so this is finding necessary and sufficient conditions. So that's an open question that we are, we are leaving for the combinatorists. Uh, but the combinatorial theorem that we get is that we prove the existence of an inductive construction based on the combinatorial resultants. So vice versa, in other words, yeah? So if you give me a rigidity circuit, circuit, then we can obtain it inductively by applying this operation starting from the leaves that are K4 graphs. So the construction is captured by this tree. It's a tree where at every node, I'm doing a combina, it's a binary tree. I'm doing a combinatorial resultant on a certain edge for the two summons. And, uh, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a theorem, yeah? So that is our main result, combinatorially speaking. Now, this tree turns out that is not unique. So we can obtain the same graph with, let's say this tree and maybe this tree and maybe this tree. So in general, there are a number of them. And when we'll turn to the algebraic aspects, implications of applying algebraic resultants following this tree, they will have severe implications on the complexity of the algorithm, on the complexity of the computation that we do and on the size of the polynomials that result. So a better understanding of the implications of the construction of this tree and defining what would be the best one remains an open question, okay? Now, the proof is, however, an adaptation of a weaker lemma that we actually got from bergen Jordan's proof. And they prove um, that uh, that lemma is just says that there are two non-adjacent vertices of degree three on which a Hennebert operation can be performed. And with that lemma, the construction, the proof of our main combinatorial theorem is captured by these two pictures. So now I'm, I'm here a little bit uh, unclear how long should I continue? So uh, I'm stopping for a moment to, to know whether um, I should spend a moment on this theorem or stop or rush through the rest of my slides to give you the outcome. Uh, can you let me know, please? Uh, you definitely have at least 10 more minutes, maybe. Okay, okay good. I wasn't sure whether I have 50 minutes or, or not. Good. So uh, if I have 10 minutes, then I can definitely finish. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the, the main proof, right? So let's go over it. I mean, it, it's, it's fun to have at least one proof and that's complete. <laughs> so what do we have? We have a graph that is a three connected circuit and it has N plus one vertices, at least five. 
And then in polynomial time, and this is n to the square, n to the third, it depends on algorithms called table games. Anyway, in polynomial time, we can find two circuits, smaller graphs, such that one of them has exactly n vertices, so it's exactly one fewer vertex. The other has at most n vertices. And our graph, our C, can be represented as a combinatorial resultant of A and B, A and B, both of them being circuits. So that's the theorem. And that is what makes everything work from now on. And the theorem starts with applying the lemma from Berg and Jordan that we have two vertices, the, the red and the blue. They are vertices of degree three, and they are not directly connected to each other. That's all we need. And then what we do is let's take, let's remove the vertex of degree three. And uh, the lemma in Bergen Jordan says that we can, if we delete the three red edges, we can put an edge between the remaining, uh, between the endpoints. So we put this edge so that what remains is a circuit. And this will be our circuit A. Okay. So now how do we get B? Well, we B, now we focus on the blue vertex. We already placed this edge here. So now I'm going to remove these three edges. And it turns out that what remains is a Laman plus one graph, Laman plus uh, one graph, and that has a unique circuit, and that's our circuit B. And it is immediate to verify that uh, the, the, uh, the combinatorial result and sum of these two, the red and the blue graph, give us the original circuit. So we can proceed backwards. We get the tree. So that's the proof. OK. Now, here are some open questions. So we have not uh, analyzed all the aspects of this. So we still don't know whether the proof go, goes forward. Uh, uh, the construction goes in the, in the direction of starting from K fourth. What else shall we enforce other than having a Laman graph so that we always get a circuit? That's a remaining a problem. We don't know whether there are infinite families of these trees that are balanced or exponential in size, because that would affect the complexity, the overall complexity of the algorithm. It is possible that if they are exponential in size, we may still get a, um, we may still get a, a double exponential algorithm, <laughs> although a better structured one. But we have not encountered that. We have we have not been able. And even if there are infinite families of such resultant trees. Uh, we can obtain the same circuit by some other tree. So there are lots of interesting problems here. So meaning that we can uh, guide our algorithm to follow a tree that is cl more clever rather than doing brute force uh, uh, following some uh, exponential size tree. Yeah, lots of problems still uh, open and we can work on them in <laughs> whatever uh, time. Uh, so uh, combinatorial problems. So that's about the end of the combinatorial part. So now to get to the algebraic part, this is the essence, right? So we will use the combinatorial result, the combinatorial inductive construction as a blueprint and we'll apply Sylvester resultants. And Sylvester resultants take two polynomials and eliminate one variable between the two. So it's exactly what we are doing. We take two graphs and eliminate one variable between the two. But there is a whole uh, set of, um, of uh, theorems and results that prove that what we get in the end is the circuit polynomial. So let me uh, give you an overview of the algorithm. So this is the algorithm. But uh, let's walk over it slowly. So the first part is the essence, right? So we compute the combinatorial, uh, sorry, we compute the Sylvester resultant of two polynomials corresponding to the two circuits, eliminate. If the polynomial is already irreducible, we are done. And in some cases we were fast because it was irreducible. We don't know under what conditions this is it. So that's another open question. We don't know under what conditions on the circuits or on the, on the circuit polynomials on anything. We don't know if there is a combinatorial condition that will tell us that what we obtain is an, an irreducible polynomial. We don't know. 
So that's an open question. Try to identify conditions. Since we don't know, and by the way, we have examples where this step is necessary. Yes, yeah, so it's not always irreducible. Then we just factorize the polynomial. And what we have to do is one of these factors is clear, is known. That's a theorem, follows from the algebra, follows from the properties of the uh, Cayley-Menger ideal being a prime ideal and uh, being a principal ideal. And, and from the Lovas and Dress theorem, it follows that there will be one factor up to multiplicity, a unique one that will be in the uh, will be the um, circuit polynomial. We have to discard the other factors. How can we do that? So now here's another property that we have noticed. Sorry. Um, in all the examples that we have obtained so far, the extra factors have smaller support. And because smaller support means that they are independent in the ideal, it means that they, they cannot support polynomials in the ideal. They cannot be the circuit polynomial. So they have to, they can be discarded, right? So it's a, a algebraic interpretation of a property that comes directly from the definition of the uh, matroid. The problem is that we do not have examples where uh, this is not valid and we are, we are almost conjecturing that maybe it's true. And in fact, um, I gave this talk a month and so ago and somebody in the audience proposed the solution, but then we found a glitch in it. So it's not sure, it's not clear that this will not be enough. But since we don't know if it's sufficient or not, so this remains the outstanding open problem from here. And it's you know for people who handle polynomials and Cayley Menger ideals every day. They may see a property. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, for the other situations, we need to continue the algorithm. And uh, since we don't know exactly whether this is true or not, and to continue, we have to apply ideal membership test on the remaining factors. And the unique factor for which the ideal membership test succeeded is our circuit polynomial. And the, the, you know, the catch here is that ideal membership test is still done with Grubner basis, but there is a, there is a twist here. Uh, we, we read the, as much as we could in the literature. The Grubner basis with elimination, everybody says that it's not practical, but Grubner basis with other uh, type of um, uh, elimination orders like monomial orders seems to be working well. So the hope is that if we ever come to such a situation, it will still beat the original uh, Grebner basis algorithm. Definitely it beats on the examples that we have seen so far. Good, so lots of open questions. So let me finish with, I'm done in 30 seconds. Another collection of open questions, this time algebraic, yeah? And, um, and here, since I went um, slowly, <laughs> but maybe fast, uh, if uh, you ask, everything that I told you in the second part, in the algebraic part, requires a lot of proofs. And that's the bulk of our paper, is making sure that every single thing is correct. And so this requires uh, a thorough understanding of the implications of the algebraic rigidity matrix for the KD Menger ideal. Yes, which is the following. So now finally, let me introduce it to you. So we have a square matrix of distances where the variables correspond to square distances. And the Cayley matrix is obtained by bordering it with ones and with zeros on the diagonal. And Cayley's theorem, so apparently this appeared in, in his first paper, 1841 or something. So it's amazing. Uh, apparently it was also, from what I read, uh, one of the first papers that maybe even the first paper that was using some sort of matrix notation. In any case, uh, Cayley's theorem is that if the distances arise from n points in the Euclidean space of dimension d, the rank of the matrix is at most d plus two. So into d, it means that all the five by five minors must vanish. And the vanishing of these, uh, of these minors give us the polynomials that define this polynomial ideal called the Cayley-Menger ideal. That's where, what we are working with. We are working with these polynomials.
Yeah. So these are the generators of the KD Menger ideal. So it is a prime ideal. Prime ideals induce algebraic matroids. All of these are properties that wouldn't work otherwise. And uh, we need to um, prove the uh, isomorphism between the algebraic and the combinatorial rigidity matroid. And uh, finally, apply this theorem of Lovas and Dres from 87 that circuit polynomials are essentially unique. So they would induce uh, principal ideals and prime ideals. So I guess I can stop here. Uh, maybe I want to mention Van der Verden because the algebraic matrix were the first ones that were defined and uh, maybe some uh, uh, advertisement for, for a paper popularized the topic of, polyno of uh, circuit polynomials appeared in the Math Monthly uh, a year ago. And uh, that's about it, right? So I conclude with this slide telling you that there are lots of interesting questions and here are some of them, combinatorial, algebraic, and that's it. And that's the main reference for now. And the paper is also on the archive and soon a Polish version of it will be available. Thank you, Juliana. Beautiful how so many different tools are combined together here. Very nice. Yes. Now, now would be a good time to ask questions, have comments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Juliana, that was lovely. Um, I somehow missed what it is that makes the combinatorial resultant more general than the twosome. Could you define that the combinatorial resultant once more? So. Um, You've got two circuits, right? So yes. So you have two graphs, and you the graphs have something in common, right? Have some vertices and edges in common, yeah. And uh, one thing that is relevant is that what they have in common has to have to be a minimally rigid graph, like a, an edge, a triangle, two triangles, something that is a Laman graph. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a necessary condition. Now, on this common part, you remove one edge. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then if you do the counting and apply the sparsity, you realize, oh, but if because it was Laman, then this whole thing has exactly two n minus two. It has the right count for being a circuit. Yes. However, this is not true in general. Yes. It's not sufficient to do this. You just take any. But vi when we work in reverse, when we start with a circuit, we prove the existence of two circuits so that their combinatorial resultant is what we what we wanted. I see. Yeah. yeah? So, so in so reverse, two, yeah. yes, from top down, it works. We can prove the existence. But if you give me some bunch of K4s and say, put them together so that we get a circuit, I wouldn't know how to proceed. You have to tell me the goal. This is what you want to get. That's the graph you want. Then I can proceed and split it. But to do it, vice versa, to put the pieces together to get where I want, I don't know yet. We don't see. know yet. So that's yeah, the combinatorial question. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So I see, so the, so the two sum is just the special case. Exactly. What the two graphs have in common is just the one edge. One edge, exactly, yes. Okay, very good. Yes, exactly. I have another question, but I'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> Try it now, Peter. All right, I'll try it now. Okay, so back when when uh, you computed the uh, circuit polynomials for for your circuits of size four, five, and six, um, so all this is in two dimensions. But one of your circuits, the double banana, has different three dimensional properties from the others, and I was wondering whether that shows up somehow in the polynomial. Um, so the double banana is not reconnected, right? So right. Yeah, so everything, so all the circuits that are not reconnected will be obtained by two sum. But in fact, we can obtain them also by some other um, other manners. So we have actually the double banana can be obtained as a two sum, but also as a combinatory resultant of some other circuits. Yeah, so it can be obtained in many ways. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we have not figured out whether those that are obtained, whether connectivity, in other words, whether three connectivity and two connectivity reflects in the polynomial in any way. 
we don't know. These mm. polynomials are so huge. So the main, they have started being investigated, but because of the lack of examples, what can you study if you don't see anyone, right? So those that we compute, we actually put them on a GitHub. So there, there is a group of enthusiasts in, in uh, rigidity theory that are interested in this part. <laughs> so uh, whoever wants to contribute and has faster and better machines than us and can compute one that we were unable to compute with our method or others, they can put it there. But everything that we computed is available. So now at least we have some data to investigate the combinatorial properties of these polynomials. I've, I view this as the beginning of a, of, a, of a research direction rather than solving everything because it's far from being solved. Yeah. But distance geometry has been around for, you know, since uh, Menger and uh, the, the, all the great uh, distance geometry people from the 20th century. And it's such a beautiful area, so fascinating. So I'm very excited that we got something that gives some insight into what is happening uh, in, 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 the, uh, in this world. Okay. <laughs> And I'm, I'm happy, uh, Lou, since you are here, may I mention one thing? So before you came, I mentioned that I'm very grateful and I mentioned also in my talk, I'm very grateful uh, to be talking at this seminar because uh, I learned about uh, these resultants I first heard by attending a course of Ricky many years ago and I was coming to this seminar. And I also want to mention that in fact, I learned about matroids Many years ago, when at Rutgers, there was a conference, I was a graduate student at the time, and somebody, I asked somebody and says, what are you working on? Oh, matrix, and what are those? And it would look like something that is going over my head at that time. And so years later, the matrix are bread and butter in the research I'm doing. And so it is because of that conference. And I remember you were at Rutgers at the time, and it was a conference that uh, you, you organized, and it was a student of yours or somebody who told me about this. So it's, it's just, it's a small world. So it's so so much fun to come to this, uh, uh, to be with you, to, to be back in the geometry group, right? So it's where we can exchange ideas and learn new things. I'm, I'm really grateful that you restarted the, uh, the seminar. That's what I, what I wanted to say. Yeah, so this is a DIMAX meeting, was it? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah many years ago. <laughs> many. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, Liana, uh, I have a comment which may or may which may or may not be relevant. Okay. Yes, Joe. The uh, it turns out that one way to think of uh, the Kaylee Menger uh, idea for uh, the three-dimensional simplex is that you're determining what the volume oh, yes. of uh, either a tetrahedron in three space or a degenerate tetrahedron, in other words, a complete quadrilateral in the plane. Yeah. Uh, so when the tetrahedron collapses into the plane, the volume of this uh, uh, given by a certain determinant is zero. And when, uh, uh, and you can also uh, use these ideas to determine uh, uh, sufficient conditions that six edge lengths, even uh, even if they evade the triangle inequality for all the faces, they may not uh, actually determine a physical tetrahedron in three space because the volume yeah. may be zero. Uh, so there's there was a man who uh, named McCray who wrote a book on analytic geometry in um, quite a long time ago in which instead of doing this with uh, a determinant, I guess it's a four by four determinant, he gets the result for the volume of a tetrahedron with a uh, sort of nifty three, to, you know, uh, smaller determinant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So have you come across that? I don't yeah, know yeah. whether that- Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I know what you are referring to, and I can I can tell you what it is. So th there is so much beautiful stuff behind this. So the Cayley Menger ideal can be defined from the Cayley matrix, uh, which is n plus one times n plus one, right? N vertices by n plus another right. line. But there is also the Gram matrix, which is two rows and two columns smaller. And there, the rank condition is two smaller, so from a from a smaller matrix. So we could work with the Gram matrix rather than the Cayley matrix. But there are certain reasons that I it's see. more symmetric and the results are easier to prove if we work with, on this. There are some subtleties about what exactly we are generating and what we are obtaining. So I I know what you are talking about. Definitely, it's the it's the so-called. I, I don't remember. I don't know whether what McCray McCray did applies in also in n space, but I will send you the reference uh, because the it's a very very symmetric uh, oh. matrix where the entries in the matrix are the six lengths of the uh, so it, it's parameterized in a different way. Uh, so it sort of looks at the residues between sums of squares. Uh, mm -hmm of the uh of pairs of edge lengths and uh so I'll, I'll send you the reference uh it's very uh i i don't know whether it generalizes but it it's i don't think it's quite the same as the gram matrix business okay yeah that that would be interesting thank you so much thank you yes wonderful 